Thank you. Thank you so much. For the very short, let's give it up. Thanks for letting me spend a little time with you today. Uh, you people are certifiably insane, which I think is uh, really wonderful. And I say that as someone who has visited a number of states' conventions recently, so I know where by which I speak. Uh, even by the standards of the Libertarian Party, some of you people are absolutely insane. Thank you. Uh, and for me, of course, that is uh, no insult whatsoever. So, uh, speaking of, of you, and speaking of being insane, um, which is absolutely what we are speaking about tonight, it turns out to be true, don't tell me that you didn't see it coming, it turns out to be true that your government took money from you and your neighbors and other people around your state and people elsewhere in the United States, pooled it with a bunch of money from other people whose governments took it also from them, forcibly and then invested it uh, through an international shell corporation in a laboratory in China where uh, research was conducted that Dr. Fauci says was not gain of function research. Uh, as Senator Rand points out, it certainly rhymes with gain of function research. Uh, but it, however you might categorize it, clearly it assisted the laboratory in conducting gain of function research as well as other research. A viral agent was developed there, uh, which was not otherwise found in nature, and uh, escaped from the laboratory. Um, please God, let it be by accident, right? It killed a couple million people in the United States, it killed uh, several million people around the world. Your government decided not to tell you about this, and indeed, most of your government still believes it is worth keeping from you, that this is not something that you need to understand, either how the virus uh, was initiated or uh, your government's role in providing financing for it. This is all something that you don't need to understand. The fact that it killed millions of people is really bad. Let's not uh, overlook that. Sometimes as libertarians, we skip right over the public policy issues. <coughs> I would like to argue that none of that story that I have just described is the worst part of that story. Uh, so if I, if I may, put a pin in that and just hold on to that thought just for a minute. Because it also turns out to be true that your government took money from you and your neighbors, again forcibly, also took money, uh, other governments took money from their constituents, again forcibly mixed it together, again invested it without your knowledge or the knowledge of anybody else, again with a foreign nation in a facility that you do nothing about, that the White House continues to lie to you about. And they use that to finance an operation whereby which an oil pipeline at the bottom of the Baltic Sea was exploded in an act that would normally be considered an act of war, interestingly against the people of Germany, which is not a thing to think about. It has cost the German people, and is going to cost the German people over the next few years, dozens of billions of dollars in increased energy costs. And, somewhat ironically, if you believe what the White House says its objectives are, somewhat ironically, is going to increase the flow of petrodollars to the Russian government. All of this, uh, your government continues to believe is nothing that you need to know anything about. The destruction, which costs probably on the order of dozens of billions of dollars, the increased costs, the fact that it's an act of war against uh, someone who is ostensibly an ally of ours, all of that is really bad. And again, we should not skip over the fact that billions of dollars of expenses are being wasted on behalf of people who have every much of a right as any of uh, the rest of us to pursue peace and prosperity. Let's not skip over that so easily. But again, I would like to argue that none of that story is the worst part of that story either. So let's, let's put a pin in that. What I believe the worst parts of these two stories are, these two stories that seemingly have absolutely nothing to do with each other, the worst parts are that they have everything to do with each other. 
that they were both driven by money taken from you forcibly, and that this money was used by a government that operates in the shadows, and regularly. Today, in the news, a young man has been arrested and is going to be prosecuted in a way that undoubtedly will ruin the rest of his life because he thought there was no option other than either staying completely quiet or risking going to jail by revealing government secrets. Have you all looked at the description of the secrets? Even CNN's description, we were just talking about this uh, earlier, even CNN's description, CNN, which is for all practical purposes an outlet for the White House. Even CNN's description of the material that was released is such to lead you to believe that there's really nothing in there that should be kept a secret but for the fact that the White House doesn't want you to know about it. Because what it says is, that the government investment in Ukraine is not going very well, you're not getting a very good return on your dollar, and it's not actually going to help the Ukrainian people in the long run. That's what they don't want you to know about. From whom else could they be effectively keeping this a secret? The Russians already know. The Ukrainians already know. It's only us that they don't want to have find out about this. This is what is the essence of these stories, that your government operates in a fashion that advances the interests of those in the government, the politicians who lead it, their interests, their aggrandizement, their power, not yours. That's what this is all about. Now normally, as you might expect, I spend a lot of time going around to conventions talking about the opportunity that we have in 2024. And we all know what that opportunity looks like. I don't want to talk about that tonight. As a matter of fact, maybe I could condense it really quick. Everybody hates the Republicans and the Democrats. They're leading to greater authoritarianism. They have crappy leadership. Polls suggest that people are open to the idea of a third party like never before. And I believe that we can take advantage of that if we run the right type of campaign. Yeah. That's what it looks like. Everybody's a Gary Johnson fan. Everybody's a Joe Jorgensen fan. Great. <laughs> Put a pin in that just for a moment. Because I am too. But if you're running a campaign that's based on I'm fiscally conservative like a Republican and socially liberal like a Democrat, you're not actually, not actually running for president, with all due respect. Amen. Yep. You're, you're defining yourself in the context of the other parties. You're not giving people any reason to remember you, anything to hang on to. We were making fun of Aleppo a little bit, uh, a little while ago. The real tragedy of Gary's forgetting what Aleppo was at that moment was not that remembering these things like this is so important. Now, I don't want to let him completely off the hook. You're obliged more than the, you know, next dude on the street to know what the hot topics are that are likely to be asked of you when a national television camera is in your face. So I don't want to let him off the hook completely. But let's contrast that with Donald Trump, which is kind of a weird thing to say at a libertarian convention. <laughs> don't mishear me. I'm no fan of the Donald. I was in New York in the 80s. I got long history of reasons not to be a fan of the Donald. But having said that, you have to kind of say, maybe he's got something there when he said, I could probably go down on the Fifth Avenue and shoot someone without losing a whole lot of support. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, forgetting the name of a town in Syria is not as bad as shooting someone on Fifth Avenue. What do you say? Yeah. <laughs> the Donald may have been right. Because everybody already knew what they liked about him, what they didn't like about him. Not so with Gary. Not only had he not given people a reason to hang on, and therefore the campaign imploded when he made this otherwise relatively minor mistake, possibly. People didn't have a reason to hang on to him 
because of this slogan, reflected the nature of his campaign. And let's be clear, that slogan isn't even honest. He was actually lying to people. We're not socially liberal in the sense that Democrats are. We don't go around canceling each other because everyone has to stay in lockstep. I heard more argument at that table than the entire Democratic Party that year, right? <laughs> just, just in a half an hour. <laughs> and that was merely over the definition of what a Mormon for marijuana is. <laughs> This is the reason why I record my own video, so I can edit these things out. Because we heard it live. Outside of this state, I don't think I'm allowed to say, ironically, Mormons for marijuana. <laughs> imagine how much I would have to explain to be able to say that in my home state of Virginia. Which is kind of weird that we crossed in the airplane. You should have just called me. I could have gone down the street to UVA and help you out there. It's very important that we run the kind of campaign that gives people something to hang on to. Just as a matter of politics, which is also not something I want to talk to you about tonight. The reason it's important is because the reason for our opportunity is because our nation is not going in the right direction. And I believe that it's going in the wrong direction in an accelerating fashion. It's getting worse. If you look at the Republican and Democratic parties over the great span of history, and I mean a long period of time, uh, longer than the lifespans of most of the folks in the room. No disrespect, Justin. But uh, when I was a kid, right, Republicans uh, had an agenda. Democrats had an agenda. You could not find a great number of Democrats today who could credibly say, I'm anti-war. Not really going to happen that in a credible fashion, right? You don't see really a lot of Republicans even any longer pay much lip service to be, being fiscally conservative. Few of them pay lip service, but effectively actually executing on it, not so much. We're going in the wrong direction in a way that I believe is starting to be revealed to the American public, this is our opportunity. Whereas our economy looks a lot the way it did in the late 70s and early 80s, again, trust me, the way Americans react to it is a little bit different in the sense that we no longer, as Americans, not just as libertarians, we no longer look at democratic institutions in the, in the United States the same way as we used to. There's a lot less trust. I'm not arguing that that's a good thing. I'm not arguing it's a good thing for the entire populace of the United States to no longer trust its government. <laughs> that would be weird to say that was a good thing. But given that our government has earned that mistrust, that's a natural reaction to it. This is our opportunity. The reason this is so important is because we, as libertarians, we are the philosophical descendants of the people that put this nation together, the people that assembled our Constitution, the people who founded this country, and did so for only one good reason, and that is to protect our individual rights and our liberties. A lot of historians argue about the reasons why the Constitution was put together, the reason the government was put together. Nobody came to this continent for any of those other reasons. The reason this government exists the reason this nation was eventually put together was to protect individual rights. This is our reason for being. If we continue to go the direction in which we're going now, our government is not going to survive. This is a problem, not because the government is such a great thing, <laughs> but because it puts the entire democratic experiment that the American nation represents at risk of no longer being able to carry a torch for the rest of the world. This matters. Does anyone really believe that a Republican is going to stand up for your individual rights? No. It's not going to happen. It's just not. That a Democrat is going to stand up for your individual liberties. That a Democrat is going to stand up for the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, 
not in this lifetime. The number of people we have in this room is wonderful, right? We're lucky we have the 40 people in the room that we have. It's just terrific. So don't misread what I'm about to say. Even if you multiplied it by 50 for all of the states around the United States, it's not a big number. Even if you were to say, we have a couple of thousand people in our party that are willing to work our butts off to make a difference, it's not a big number. We have to do things right. Harder, louder, more strategic. And in a less compromising fashion, in my view. If we don't stand up for our principles, our principles will not be stood up for, if that makes sense. In other words, this is not merely an opportunity for us in 2024. This is an obligation. This is a responsibility. This is a call of duty. And this, in my view, is likely to be close to our last reasonable opportunity, our last best chance to stop our government from sliding even further. As an economist, I spend a lot of time talking about end the Fed. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's different being an economist talking about it for a couple of different reasons. One is you're sort of obliged to have a plan, which our campaign does. It's also strange because I spent decades working with a lot of economists from the Federal Reserve System. A lot of friends, great people, great economists, some of the smartest people uh, in all of economics. Well-meaning people, public servants, people who want to do the right thing. I met with the Federal Reserve Board in the boardroom itself. It can be a very intimidating experience. I had my research in the banking industry cited publicly by the Fed Chairman. It's an experiment that can't work. We know that now. And we try. I mean, come on, 100 years, you've got to admit you've given it the effort, right? At no point can you now any longer say, well, we didn't really try, right? <laughs> We have institutional problems in the United States. We have problems that are not just, well, inflation's a little high. <laughs> um, you know, should we have Republican or Democrat? Who's gonna work harder on reducing it? Come on, would you stop it, please? Our problems are really deeply rooted. The federal government should not be in the law enforcement business. We need to get rid of the FBI. We need to get rid of it. Yeah. And some of its functions are worth saving. You know, send a piece off here to the, the, the Army and send a piece to the states and a piece just, you know, doesn't need to be done. The IRS represents a relationship between the federal government and individuals that should not exist. And anyone who's been audited, yes. yeah. Yeah. anyone who's been audited knows this. Anyone here been audited? I know you have. I mean, I have it. There you go. Mm -hmm. okay, I, I'll call them myself. Because you should be audited. I can just tell. <laughs> that is an oversight. You know, that I want in on all three cameras. This guy, that's a complete oversight. As a matter of fact, I don't even know if I believe it. You must be lying. I would audit you myself. Anyone who's been audited knows it's a very unpleasant experience. And it's not because you did anything wrong. I mean, most people who get audited, it's not even because you did anything wrong, right? The reason it's such a horrible experience is because of the nature of the investigation. You're presumed guilty in IRS court. They literally have their own courts. Until you can prove that you are correct. And because of the enormous imbalance of power. This is the essence of why we talk about how important it is to decentralize authority. Yeah! It's because the federal government has no business raising revenue except from the states. A state can stand up to the federal government, not perfectly, this is no silver bullet, but certainly the state of Utah ought to be able to muster more oomph against the federal government than we can. Yes. Yeah. This is why 
these institutions need to be reformed or in some cases eliminated completely. These are the types of reforms and principles that we need to stand up for because nobody else will. And remember, please, it's not, the following doesn't need to be said, but I'll say it anyway, gratuitously. It's obviously not about me. It's not about you either. And I don't think there's anyone in the room who really probably needs to be reminded of that. It's not about you, as wonderful as you are, right? As much as some people ought to be audited. It's not about, it's not about him or her or anybody in particular in this room. It's about Americans who are least able to resist the power and the authority of the government. People who cannot, it's people who cannot stand up to the world's most oppressive criminal justice system. We hurt families in a way that lasts generations with our war on drugs, our bad housing policy, our horrendous education policies at the local level and at the state level and at the federal level. <laughs> it impacts mostly on the local level. The persistence of intergenerational poverty in this country is not something that would be predicted in a free market environment. Persistent intergenerational poverty is a phenomenon caused by bad public policy. It is something peculiar to the way we run systems in the United States. It is not the result of capitalism or freedom or free markets. Every day that we don't stand up against those forces, we're letting people down that are not in this room. People whom we call brothers and sisters for no other reason than the fact that they're Americans to whom we have an obligation. People are ready for a new relationship with the government of the United States. People who live in the United States, but also people who live abroad. Like no time in the past, people outside of our nation are ready for a new relationship with the American government. Unless, unless an interventionist government, a less militaristic government. If we don't stand up to that, nobody else will. And that's why it's not just a, an opportunity for us. This truly is our call of duty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> if it's okay with Barry, uh, just a couple questions. Absolutely. Okay. Um, but we do have a rule now. Uh, which uh, has been imposed by very important powers that be. So just go with it, okay? Don't give me a hard time about what our rule is. Weird questions only. Okay. Weird ones? Strange questions, weird questions. Where do babies come from? <laughs> I can answer that. I can answer that. Babies come from a man and a woman. <laughs> you can buy a woman. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I appreciate that question. <laughs> Let's be clear. To me, there are three things going on in this discussion. One is, we need to be able to stand up for the basic notion that facts and truth matters, right? Okay. We are a species with two sexes. Occasionally things go wrong. But for the most part, like all mammals, we are a species of two sexes. It's important to be able to say that without feeling like you're going to go to jail. <laughs> the second thing that's going on is that as libertarians, we believe that you should be able to live your life, your style, your world, according to your own standards, not the standards of someone else at your table or in your family, certainly not the hell in your government, right? You do you. If you want to identify as fill in the blank, you do you. If you want to live a life that is absolutely nothing like anything you've ever seen before, I've ever seen before, or anyone else has ever seen before, you do you. 
I believe that everybody in this room would lay down your life for this to be a nation in which people felt comfortable doing whatever the hell they felt like doing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's the second piece. The third piece is that things change in this discussion when it comes to public policy. Culture is all great, right? No, it sucks. But when <laughs> our culture is a little messed up, but that's all great that it does its thing, right? Public policy is downstream from culture. When culture touches public policy, and now public policy adopts some weird shit, all of a sudden it becomes something that we, as a political party, are obliged to care about. So, I would like to say, what do I care? But every once in a while, something comes up that means we're obliged to care, right? And so, let's lean on our basic principles. It's none of the federal government's business. The federal government needs to leave ideas to the states about how they want to enforce their criminal codes, what they want to criminalize, and how they go about protecting individual rights. Absolutely bedrock. On the other hand, we also have to stand up for the idea that states themselves can go too far. I come from the last 20 years until the last year and a half in Virginia. I spent 20 years in, in Florida. And there are certain things that our governor in Florida has done pretty well. We all gave it up for him when he kept the schools open, the businesses open. Uh, it was a great thing during COVID. And I got to tell you, as a police officer, there's nothing more embarrassing than asking people to leave a swimming pool because there's a virus in your town. <laughs> That's a weird thing, okay? So that conversation used to be something like, hi, um, my boss's 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 boss says, I got to tell you, there's a virus in town, and the mayor says you're not supposed to be in the swimming pool. And now just before you start yelling at me, I say, whoa, 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 whoa. I said I had to tell you, okay? I don't need to discuss it with you. I don't need to discuss it. I'm getting back in the car, okay? I fulfilled my job. Now, if you please excuse me, I need to go to the next swimming pool. Okay? So the fact that DeSantis allowed certain things to be open again was terrific. So I don't mean to run the guy down completely, because I owe him that. But when you're taking away the rights of municipalities to decide how to run their school boards, even if I disagree with them, way the school board is going. They still have a right to screw it up on their own. They don't need a governor to decide that. Amen. And I think that we need to remember that a little bit, that sometimes the answers that we're struggling with and the questions we're struggling with are really coming down to who should be making those decisions. And that, I think, will relieve some of the tension about where babies come from. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to say, with all due respect... I'm just keeping it weird. I know. With all due respect, he does have a head start on you when it comes to being weird. So, <laughs> I spent a while with this guy at the bar, and I happen to know that it's very unlikely he's going to say anything that's not weird. <laughs> we agree the Fed needs to go away. Do you think the dollar should be pegged to gold, to Bitcoin, or just left as fiat? Uh, none of those three. Okay. Uh, all of which uh, are wonderful, I'm sure. Um, Not fiat. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, I'm sure, to someone else. It, it, we need a rules-based system for a much, 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 much harder currency. I don't think, uh, and I don't mind arguing about this, I wouldn't go all the way back to pegging to gold because I don't trust gold that much more than I trust any other one single thing. Now the Fed's idea originally was to peg it to something. Uh, it wouldn't be gold. It would be the perfect thing. It would be an entire basket of goods all over. And, and so we would have price stability. 
Sounds perfect. What could go wrong? <laughs> well, what goes wrong is that the Fed then got it into its head that we could lean against the boom-bust cycle. And it turns out that they screwed that up. So, uh, I would go almost all the way to gold. I would say, I would adopt, uh, and, and this is what economists do when they really, you know, aren't, aren't in, a, in a crowd that's necessarily going their way. I'm going to put this on someone else. <laughs> so this, is, this is Milton Friedman's idea. Okay? Um, Milton Friedman's idea was that you would not peg the inflation rate, per se, or the price tied to a basket of uh, commodities, per se. But what, uh, what you ought to do is fix the growth rate of the money supply. So uh, we, we have different techniques for measuring money supply. You would allow that to grow at a fixed rate, say 2% a year. The, the, the number you pick is not all that important. What is important is that it never changes. You can pick zero, you can pick 1%, 2%, 3%, and then you don't waver from that. So the idea would be that if you saw some inflation or deflation, you would know why. It wasn't because of the money stock increasing or decreasing. You'd know there was something going on in the economy. This is really important because in today's environment, when you see inflation or deflation, you don't know whether the lion's share of it is because of Fed policy, which it frequently is, or whether it's because we're heading into a recession or we're, we're in the boom phase of the boom bust cycle, and it's very difficult to tease that out, which means the entire pricing mechanism, which as we all, uh, as free marketers know, is critical to the well function uh, well-functioning economy, all that is lost. So what you do is you fix the money stock and let inflation and deflation do what they're going to do on their own. You could fix the money stock at zero growth, just whatever money stock we have, that's going to be it, which would be deflationary. And we don't have anything that's going to tell us, research-wise, that deflation is going to be all that much better to handle than inflation. You don't get all the bad things that you get with inflation, like running down everyone's value, but you do get some pretty weird things. So the idea would be to pick a number like 2% or 3% to sort of loosely reflect the world's appetite for dollars so that you wouldn't get very much inflation or deflation, but then you completely eliminate the discretion of the Fed. Remember, the Fed has three functions. One is the monetary policy, you need to take that one away. The other is its balance sheet, which it uses to bail out people. You take that away, you transfer it to the Treasury Department, you make it subject to federal legislation, which is no silver bullet, because we know the legislators can do some pretty stupid things. But at least you would make it impossible to bail out institutions in the middle of the night. The third function is a regulatory function. You give banks the right to opt out of federal regulation, they can opt into other regulators, which they can do now, by the way, or go without a regulatory authority at all, which I don't think many would do. But in this way, you break up the Fed into three functions and sunset each of the three separately, which is our plan for ending the Fed. Sir. Mike, are you in favor of uh, the... No. <laughs> no. <laughs> that's weird. Yeah, that's are, weird. You, are you in favor of a more secession, the idea of secession, or more that the states should execute more of their functions locally because the problem is smaller countries are more efficient. They, because they're smaller, they have to conduct trade. Mm -hmm. They have to have favorable tax treatment, mm -hmm. uh, favorable policies, mm -hmm. and relationships with countries is beneficial. Agreed. That's not the case in the United States. Agreed. So in your opinion, should we have more secession? Should we just have uh, just the control taken away from the feds? Mm -hmm. What do you see as the, being a, a better solution? Yeah. Uh, I was in, uh, this is going to require a bit of a story, uh, but I promise not too much of a story. Uh, to tell you where the story is going, uh, I don't advocate for full secession. I'm going to explain why. I do advocate for some of the benefits of secession without seceding. So, uh, I was at the Florida Convention when I was still uh, in Florida. Actually, I recently moved out of Florida, but was visiting back when uh, the Libertarian Party voted to secede. And this is a really important concept because the party did not vote that we think that we ought to have the right to secede. That was considered uh, water under the bridge. 
The party voted to secede. It voted, yes, this is a good idea, we think we ought to secede. And part of the resolution was to ask uh, LP uh, National to uh, form a policy to advocate for this, which it, of course, declined to do so. I think there's a couple of different problems. One is uh, a real problem, and one is a political problem, if I can draw a distinction between the two. The political problem is that nobody in the United States wants to live in a different country. When we say secede, we typically mean, I want that jerk down the street to move out, right? Or politically, I want the line to go right between me and my brother-in-law, right? Uh, anyone who's made the trip between uh, Chicago and Springfield as many times as I have know that those are two different countries, right? <laughs> and my understanding is that you've got that in Utah too, am I right? Yep. yep. Okay, yep. so does Texas, right? Yep. yep. Anyone been to Austin lately? <laughs> We're from there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. We no, no, I'm mean, sorry to insult you. I mean, sorry, you're from Austin. <laughs> I actually like Austin, but I wouldn't want to, you know, be governed by the Austin government. But Austin's a fun place, right? It is fun. I mean, you know, music and communists. I mean, it just it's, it's, it's terrific, right? Right. So as a, as a political matter, people don't want to live in another country. And as a practical matter, we can't actually curve it up the way that would give a lot of people the autonomy that I think we're looking for. Having said that, the plan that that my team has put together, which we call the Gold New Deal. The point of the Gold New Deal is not its cute name. We're obviously making fun of the New Deal, making fun of the Green New Deal, AOC's idea. Uh, you can all read about it at goldnewdeal.org. That's my big plug. Don't go to goldnewdeal.com or they'll try to sell you some gold. <laughs> it's not a bad idea, it's just the wrong website. The idea behind the Gold New Deal is a new relationship between us and the federal government such that the power of the federal government is pushed out to the states and states should have an opt-out provision, a constitutional amendment supporting their ability to opt out of federal supremacy and to opt into unilateral nullification. Yeah! So that it would be very much like what the Tenth Amendment suggests our nation should be like. People who make fun of the Gold New Deal, by the way, which I think is wholly appropriate, I'm not being defensive, I mean, I make fun of it sometimes myself, right? People who make fun of it say, well, why couldn't we just pass the Tenth Amendment over again <laughs> and say, this time we mean it? <laughs> yeah. um, it's not a bad strategy, I'm just not sure it would work. So this is my way of suggesting we pass the Tenth Amendment over again and say this is, you know, this time we meet. <laughs> so that states would be able to chart their own political futures. I think that the way that we've structured it is a little bit more appetizing than secession in the sense that most Americans want to keep the nation together, uh, maybe for nostalgic reasons. Uh, and of course, there are certain things that we think the federal government should do. I can't remember what those are at the moment. Uh, you know, people always point to national defense, right? But by golly, national defense has gotten a little bit carried away. I wouldn't mind resetting to zero and then trying to figure it out. States should, I think, work with each other contractually and have courts oversee them. And I think the idea in our, the basic the fundamental idea in our example is that states should be able to resolve differences between their own legislated uh, aspirations and federal government oversight, they should be able to resolve those conflicts in state court, not federal court. That's what we mean by uh, by nullification. Yeah. So, that's, I don't know if that was a yes or a no. <laughs> yes, ma'am. No, Miss Guatemala, uh, 2015. Yes. He's my spokesperson. Okay. He's your spokesperson. He, he's yeah. your uh, anger translator. Yes. <laughs> um, so the question is. So please start. When I was growing up in Guatemala as a little girl, <laughs> I, you need to say it the way she would say it. I'm German. <laughs> okay, but in English. Go ahead. All right. So the question is, um, 
Uh, is it really possible to get rid of the Fed? There is so yes. much corruption going on, and yeah. it's going to be an uphill battle. Yeah. And I guess both of those are true so far. Is, Keep going. What strategy would you employ to handle that? Yeah. Uh, in Washington, uh, I probably should be more embarrassed than I am to say that I worked in Washington for like 15 years. I spent, I was an economist with the White House for a couple years, and I worked uh, in the banking industry for a long time. My observation is, and I think a lot of people would back me up on this, you can't get rid of organizations in Washington until they become irrelevant. Once they become irrelevant, you can push them over the cliff, but you have to... <laughs> You have to shrink them down first. Does that make sense? So for example, you, you, you want to get rid of the Department of Transportation. First thing you do is uh, put someone at the head of the agency, the cabinet level secretary, who hates the Department of Transportation, <laughs> who stops them from spending money, deregulates, dwindles it down until it's almost worthless. Yay, Buttigieg, yay. <laughs> <laughs> As a counterexample, counter <laughs> and then a couple years later, you start passing legislation to get rid of it piecemeal, and then after doing that for several years, you can push it over the edge. So it's the same thing with the Fed. You break it into three parts that we were just talking about, and you got to go after each one separately. Just like Republicans and Democrats like to jump on their opportunity to take advantage of a crisis. We need to do the same thing in reverse by saying when the government screws up something, we need to take advantage of that, of that as a moment at which to limit government power and authority. Yes. So we need to be able to say, uh, well, today, for example, would be a good time to say, obviously, this experiment in leaning into the boom bust cycle hasn't worked. It just leads to enormous amounts of inflation. We've got an institutional problem, and it's called the Fed. Yeah. So we need to, uh, the first thing you would do is you would appoint Fed governors, the White House appoints Fed governors, who believe in a harder currency, who believe in this idea of uh, a rules-based system as opposed to just complete discretion. Once you've gotten enough Fed governors in there, now you can move legislation that says they're not allowed discretion and they have to tie to a rule. The next step would be to get rid of their monetary authority completely, transfer it to the Treasury Department and say, you're just following this rule. And this rule you're going to implement on a contractual basis through the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, which is how it's done now. And just cut out the Federal Reserve Board completely in terms of monetary policy. And then you would do similar things uh, for the other two uh, functions of the Fed. One is, uh, uh, one is um, regulatory authority. First thing you would do is uh, move federal legislation that says banks have the right not to be regulated at the federal level. Then you would discourage anyone from continuing to be a member of the Fed. And you would move banks out of the Fed regulated sector and you would shrink down the number of banks that they regulate until finally they become relatively irrelevant, then move legislation to shut down their regulatory authority completely and spin off the Federal Reserve Banks as regional accounting firms, basically. Then the third function is their uh, balance sheet. You wait until they bailed out someone that really looks stupid. Wait until they just look as moronic as possible. It happens every few years. You wouldn't have to wait that long. Wait until they really do something stupid. That's the moment you transfer their balance sheet to the Fed, you can't, uh, to the Treasury Department, you can't have your balance sheet anymore, you screwed it up. You make the balance sheet completely under the thumb of Congress, they will love it because they think it's more power for them. Right, <laughs> right, True. right? Yeah. Now you've killed off all three pieces of the Fed and, and at that point, I don't even care, you can let them exist if you want because they can't do anything but then you would sunset the Federal Reserve Board, spin off the Federal Reserve Banks, and let them exist as private sector organizations. So it can be done. Yes, there is a lot of corruption. Yes, it would be a multi-step process. Yes, it would take a long time. Yes, it can happen in your lifetime. It might be a stretch to be in my lifetime, but it, it could absolutely be done. But it has to be done with a view of where you're going, right? Um, without compromise. 
The end cannot be compromised. You need to know where you're going without compromise. The steps to get there are piecemeal, right? But there's a big difference between compromise and stepwise toward an uncompromised endgame. Does that make sense? We're not shooting for uh, reform of the Fed. We're not shooting for audit of the Fed. I don't need an audit of the Fed. I, I, go ahead, audit them if you want. But we already, we already know what they do wrong. We know what's wrong with their balance sheet. We know why, institutionally, why they misbehave. We don't need an audit. We need to go at, after the pieces. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate thank you so much. For thank you. I appreciate it. That when you become president, yes, sir, I would really like to be ambassador to Tahiti. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>